sponsored by Suzuki. On the outskirts of the town of Castle Ree in County Roscommon lie the boundaries to the ancestral lands of the O'Connor family and a late 19th century country mansion, Clonallis House. This house was built to replace an early 18th century dwelling house close by. It was designed and built by Frederick Pepys Cockrell. However, its Victorian Italianate design belies a much more ancient connection with the land and its history. The 19th century historian John O'Donovan once wrote of the O'Connors, no family in Ireland claims greater antiquity and no family in Europe, royal or noble, can trace its descent through so many generations of legitimate ancestors. Like the O'Neills of Ulster or the O'Briens of Munster, the O'Connors of Connaught were one of the great Irish royal bloodlines and since the first century AD, the O'Connor clan has given 11 High Kings to Ireland and 26 Kings to Connacht. The Norman invasions of the 12th century effectively ended the national monarchy and ensured Rory O'Connor's place in history as the last of the High Kings of Ireland. Clonalis uh, occupies a very unique position, I think, in the history of, of Irish big houses and so far as is really the flip side uh, of the history of those houses. Uh, many of the other houses that you'll feel and there aren't that many left as you know. But um, they would really, I suppose, personify and, and um, uh, encapsulate an Anglo-Irish and largely Protestant tradition. Clonalis um, is very much a Catholic house, it's very much a, a Gaelic house. And David, uh, this is the coronation stone, or more correctly, the inauguration stone of the O'Connors, which was used in quite an elaborate ceremony which uh, took place over a period of about 1,500 years. Um, but this stone originally came from the hill of Conn Free near Tulscan County, Roscommon, and it was to that hill that the king-elect would arrive. Uh, the part of the ceremony involved the king putting his sword down in front of the stone as a token of his ability to rule his people without force of arms, and then the king would walk three times one way around the stone uh, to view all his territories, which were Yes. Mm -hmm. And then he'd reverse and walk three times the other. I love it, like a Greek Orthodox marriage. Very well. Yes. And indeed, the marriage analogy is very, is very apt because, in many ways, the inauguration of a king was very akin to a marriage. And the king effectively would symbolically marry the, the soil over which he was to rule. And in fact, part of the ceremony here involved the king putting his foot in the footstep which is carved on the top of the stone. And in many ways, that was an act of consummation. But of course, being a good Irish Catholic family, we don't talk about that kind of thing. <laughs> But a fascinating ritual. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Clonalis to us is our home. It's where we've brought up our children. It's where we live. It's also an ancestral home. And it's also steeped in Irish history. I suppose on a day-to-day -day basis, you don't even actually think about the history. But it would be untrue to say that I'm not aware of it. And particularly when I'm showing groups of people around Good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome to Clonalis House. My name is Marguerite O'Connor Nash, and Clonalis House is, in fact, the ancestral home of the O'Connor family. Now, the O'Connors were the last High Kings of Ireland, and they were also the traditional kings of Connacht. The lands here have belonged to the family for about the last 1,500 years. Now, obviously, we've lost them many, many times, but we've always managed to get something back, and my husband is the 25th generation of O'Connor to live here since the last High King. So it's not just a historical house it's also very much a family home well we quite enjoy it because it gives the house a little bit of feeling of living and life and there's a lot of history here yes, we like to share that and I think people actually genuinely enjoy it they enjoy the longevity they enjoy the continuity and they very much enjoy that there's still a family living here and that it is a family home and not just a museum 
Now, as I said to you, this house is Victorian, Italian, at an architectural style, and the Italian theme is very much carried through with all of the landscapes the whole way around. And the two fireplaces, there's one there, and there's one here, are 18th century Siena marble. And then on either side of the doorway here, two large Catterson Smith paintings again. Um, but the one on the right in particular I like is a lady called Priscilla O'Connor. And just look at all the detail there on that dress. The 17th century saw the fortunes of the O'Connor family deteriorate rapidly under the penal law system, which confiscated the lands of those unwilling to conform to English rule. Many families at that time, understandably, converted from Catholicism, at least in name, in order to save their lands. However, one member of the O'Connor family insisted on putting up a fight. Well, I suppose, you know, if I was to nominate uh, my favorite member of the family and somebody who I really regard as the patron saint of the O'Connors, it would have to be Dennis O'Connor, uh, who was born in 1674. And this man effectively is known as the heir to nothing. Uh, because what had happened was his uncle had fought against um, Oliver Cromwell and against uh, William of Orange and had lost all the O'Connor lands. So Dennis spent his early days in a bohorn or mud hut in Kilmac Tranny in County Sligo where he hired himself out for a shilling a day, all his lands having been confiscated from him. Uh, now in fact what he did was that in 1720 he fought a law case which resulted in the uh, 600 acres of O'Connor land being returned to them in the small village of Balanagar, about six miles away from here. And it was really through his efforts that the O'Connors were saved from penury and peasantry, which is otherwise going to be their lot. Um, so a man I have deep affection for. Dennis's ability to win back his lands by using the very penal laws that had deprived him in the first place was a remarkable victory, but it was not the end of the war as Piers and Marguerite were to find out over 250 years later. Very shortly after we heard about the inheritance, uh, we were called in by the family solicitor who told us that effectively while, while we had inherited the property, the bad news was that there was going to be nothing left because the inheritance tax situation was so serious. Uh, we found ourselves with a, a, a multi uh, 100,000 pound inheritance tax bill, which the estate simply couldn't have survived. It was almost 100% of the value of the property. Um, we, having regard to the, the value of Clanalis historically, we brought it to the Taoiseach at the time, Hohi, uh, who agreed that indeed the property was valuable, but essentially two years ran by and absolutely nothing happened. And eventually, at the last throw of the dice, uh, I knew a little known Labour senator at the time uh, who had lectured me in constitutional law in college, and we went to her and she said, well, the situation is very serious. It's run on a long time. I don't think there's an awful lot I can do. Um, but in fact, thanks be to God, she did. The senator in question was Mary Robinson, and in 1984, with the support of Michael D. Higgins, she met with the Minister for Finance, Alan Dukes, to plead for an amendment to a forthcoming finance bill. In her speech, she referred to Clonalis House and to the particular harshness and inequality of the operation of the Capital Acquisition Tax Act, which meant that in order to take over the property, Piers and Marguerite would have to pay five separate tax bills instead of just one. Mrs. Robinson referred to Clonalis as one of the most important houses and residues of the Gaelic culture and tradition of this country, and she explained that if the property had to be sold, it would be striking the death knell on an important part of our cultural heritage. The minister conceded that the matter was complex and that Piers was indeed the victim of a highly improbable coincidence of events. In June of the same year, the bill was passed. By selling off a large portion of the estate, Piers and Marguerite were able to pay off the remaining tax bill, and once again, the O'Connor clan had managed to save something of their ancestral lands. Uh, the intervention of, of these two Labour senators, Mary Robinson and Michael D. Higgins, as it happens at the time, um, was, the, was the absolute thing that saved Clonellis, there's no doubt about that. The children are quite interesting about it. Um, they've enjoyed, they enjoy living here. It's home to them first and foremost. They are not always that aware of the history. I think as they get older, they sense it more. They realise in many ways that to live here takes a little bit of extra work. 
We're members of the Hidden Ireland Association, so we're delighted to have guests who come and stay. They have they stay for bed and breakfast, they have dinner with us in the evening. And the children always love that time of year when it comes around because they feel that the house fills up with people and that there's noise and movement and they enjoy that. No, I think it keeps the house alive. It, just having people in and around and it gets us, it gives us a chance to, um, to share with other people what we experience every day. And uh, it, it keeps the house at home, basically. Yeah, I mean, it keeps the house literally kind of fresh. There's always new people here. Um, it keeps the house open. And I ought to say, too, that because it has 45 rooms, I don't know whether we would maintain it to the degree that we do if we weren't having guests coming on a very regular basis. So that helps us, gives us the incentive to keep working, improving and making it more and more comfortable. And this is the, the well-known archive room of Clonalis, and altogether there are around 100,000 documents, That's records. Quite a lot, yeah. mm. And they're the records, really, of, of an Irish Catholic family over the last 600 years, and very unique for that reason. So it's a real treasure house, then? Yes, it is, in many ways it is. Among the, the various many letters we have here are uh, letters written by people like Lawrence Stern, William Gladstone, Napper Tandy, leader of the 1798 Rebellion, Charles Stuart Parnell, and of course a letter from Daniel O'Connell, uh, who fought for Catholic emancipation in 1829, and who was in fact closely involved with Owen O'Connor Don, who was the first Catholic MP for Roscommon after that uh, act was passed. The title of O'Connor Don originated in a 14th century family feud. O'Connor Roe, or Rua, meaning red-headed, and O'Connor Dunn, meaning the brown-haired. The O'Connor Don and Roe became the titles used by each side of the family, and the O'Connor Don is the only branch to survive to the modern day, though unfortunately it no longer resides at Clonalis. No, the, the title and the property aren't one. My, we inherited from my uncle, uh, Father Charles O'Connor, who was the O'Connor John, the chieftain of the O'Connor clan. Uh, but when he died, uh, we inherited through my mother. And the title itself does not travel through the female line. Uh, so the present O'Connor John, who's Desmond O'Connor, lives in England and is a third cousin of mine. I think it's sad that they're separated, but unfortunately, while Desmond, I know, is very proud to be O'Connor John, and I'm sure it's sad maybe not to be living here in some ways, uh, I too would be very proud to have the title, but I fully appreciate, of course, that, uh, that that's not going to be. One of the most famous O'Connors is Dennis's son, Charles O'Connor of Ballinagar. Though he had no formal education, he became one of the greatest Irish intellectuals of his time. He was a noted historian, diarist and correspondent, and a strong advocate for the emancipation of his fellow Catholics. Charles fought to save many ancient Gaelic manuscripts from destruction, and he had the foresight to preserve his own extensive collection of letters and writings. It is as a result of his labours that the Clonallis archives are such a rich source of Irish history today, and for that, the nation owes him a great debt. And this is one of the oldest manuscripts in our archive collection. Uh, this has been identified by the scholars in Galway University as the last recorded verdict under the Brehan Law system. It has this wonderful old Irish script. And what date is it, you say? Dates from about 1580. And rather interestingly, uh, the Irish have their own legal code, um, very sophisticated legal code, which is really stamped out by Queen yes. Elizabeth I and her uh, successors. But the last, uh, the last flowering of Brehan law was in the 16th century. Well, that is, because it's fascinating to think of the two legal systems mm. uh, coexisting for a brief period. And here we have a kind of physical evidence. That's, that's right. That's right. And rather interestingly also, it deals with a land dispute, which of course, you know, the Irish are great. Oh, very central, yes. Absolutely. Among the wonderful historical documents on show in the archive room is a 17th century copy of the original death warrant for Charles I, then King of England. The warrant cites his crime as high treason, and among the 40 signatures is that of the Lord Protector himself, Oliver Cromwell. Could I bring you down, David, and show you what I think is probably the most important thing in, in um, the archive room in Clenalis, and that is the harp of O'Carolan. Oh, the famous harp. The famous yes. harp of O'Carolan. And of course, O'Carolan, who is regarded really as the, as the national bard of Ireland and a great harpist, great composer of music, was closely connected with the O'Connors in the 18th century. And of course, uh, his harp is a, is, a, is, a, is a very important part of the collection here at Clonellis. 
and it's quite a primitive instrument in a way. A very rudiment, rudimentary yeah. instrument, in fact, largely made of sycamore. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, it's perhaps rather poignant because it's a product of the time in which Joe Carrollton lived, which from, from a Gaelic point of view, of course, was a rather depressed time. In order to in have inherited the harp from Carolyn, there must have been quite a close family connection. But yes, he was very much a part of the, the, the household in, in Ballinagar, and indeed much of what we know of O'Carolyn's uh, life and his, and his music comes from the diaries of Charles O'Connor of Ballinagar, who O'Carolyn taught to play the harp. Uh, which is, you know, inc incredibly uh, significant from our point of view. Um, and uh, and O'Carolyn has perhaps gone one stage further in composing three planksies for the O'Connors. Oh. Mm. And in fact, there too, you see a portrait of a Carolyn. It's in fact, one of two portraits of a Carolyn. And he's Peter very much the blind harper, isn't he? Yeah. Yes. He had uh, smallpox as a child. And in fact, that's the reason he became a harper, because being blind, there were very few professions which he could take up. But he must have had a natural gift anyway. Oh, obviously. A yeah. wonderfully talented man. And of course, the, the Carolyn's concerto, which everybody knows, even if they don't know mm. Carolyn, they mm -hmm. know the chieftain's recording of bum, 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 da, 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 dee, 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 dee. The relationship between the residents of Ireland's big houses and their local townspeople has always been an ambiguous one, ranging from mild ambivalence to open hatred. Sean Brown, publican and railway enthusiast, is a collector of local folklore in Castle Ree. Oh, down the years there was always great respect for the Connor clan because they were of Catholics and they felt they were one of their own, so there wasn't that much divide. One way you, you can see this is by the very fact that the Clonellis House has existed to today. All the big houses around the place are all demolished. Um, I take one example. They gave the site to Saint for the church, the Catholic church here in town in St. Joseph's, which is outside the boundary because the lo local landlord wouldn't allow them to build the church at that time. And I think the people down the centuries always appreciated that. I realise, being a museum owner myself, that the amount of money that they are getting from tours is not sufficient enough to keep the place going. You know, because, I mean, it's a very short season. It starts in May and finishes in September. And uh, you nearly want to have people coming all night long nearly to keep that going. And I think people appreciate that too as well. As I have mentioned, we are actually open to the public. And obviously that generates income for the house. We have guests coming to stay, which fills our house, makes it warm and homely. Um, and, of course, that contributes greatly to the upkeep. We also then, of course, have our self-catering cottages, which are in the courtyard. And again, they led from one into another because various jobs had to be done, such as we decided to do one house initially, which we actually lived in when we came here first. We then had to re-roof all that section, so we decided to add another house. And then about eight or nine years later, we decided to add two more. And of course we have the farm. It runs over about 250 acres and it is the backbone of Clonalis, it has to be said. And it is run and managed for us by Frank Campbell. Well, there's a long tradition of mm -hmm. uh, the O'Connor's farming here. It goes back over a period of 1,500 years and uh, there's records up in the house of uh, sheep being sold in Castlereagh uh, dating back to 1730. And actually in the 1920s, uh, it was a, quite a renowned dairy herd here. Uh, when the cows would be hand milked at that stage and the milk went to uh, Dublin from the railway station in Castlereagh up to Hughes' dairies. It's still very nice to see that they still maintain the farm here and uh, for the overall appearance of the place it's still quite the same as it was all the years ago. And this is the little uh, private oratory, David, in, in the house. And as you'll notice, it is a privileged altar, altari privilegium. And what does that mean exactly? Well, effectively, any congregation hearing mass here or any priest saying mass here gains a plenary indulgence for doing so. I'm afraid I'll have to leave as a church of Ireland. <laughs> but it's wonderful. It must be very unusual to have this. Yes, it is. And uh, the, 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 the nice thing from our point of view, in fact, it's only one of two oratories in the country, private oratories in the country, which have the right to reserve the Blessed Sacrament. That certainly is a privilege. Mm. Yeah. And the author in this uh, chapter is rather interesting because 
this in fact is the thing. Well, I'm really rather envious of you. I think it is a great privilege having a chapel. One of the things I find very interesting is that although so many of the old Gaelic chieftains, like the O'Grady, the Magilla Patrick and so on, conformed to the established religion, became Church of Ireland, uh, two of the most wonderfully resonant titles, the O'Connor Don and the MacDermott Prince of Coolavin, remained steadfastly loyal to the Church of Rome. Yes, that's very true. But I think what's so compelling about that history is not that the fact that the family remained Catholic, or that is important to us, is that it is so resonant of a people who are being persecuted and, be, and suffering for what they believe in, and yet despite that persecution remain constant and true to their principles. Well, it's actually 20 years ago next month since we actually landed here. Um, I suppose initially we thought we were coming for maybe just a few months. I suppose then I didn't visualise that I would be living here 20 years later. Um, but I'm glad we're here. It seemed like an adventure at the time. We took off, we packed the bags and we headed for the west. And to be honest, it was a challenge and we've enjoyed it. I'm very proud to be associated with the house and I'd like to think that the generations that have gone down before us, many of whom I think would have gone through considerable uh, difficulties to try and preserve this history and heritage, were in a sense looking down on us and our struggles in, our, in the 19th, the 20th century and 21st century, and um, looking down almost in, in the way that one would maybe be seated in a choir in a church, uh, the generation sort of coming down and looking at our meagre efforts in the, in the present time. And I think it was a very benign, I took great comfort from that image uh, because I felt there was a great deal of ancestral goodwill to what we were doing. Well, can you think of a more delightful way to spend an autumn afternoon than coming into a room like this, throwing on a sod of your own turf from your own ancestral bog and sitting back in a nice Victorian deep-buttoned armchair and glancing around to see which of the hundreds or thousands of books in this room you'll read many of which are about your own family, be they Irish chieftains, Irish saints, or Irish politicians. I could enjoy this. Well, we have three children, uh, Margaret and I. We'd like to believe that one of the children would like to take on the challenge of bringing this uh, house and its history into the next generation. Very much a, very much a, a labour of love, we would like to think, and not, not a struggle or a, or a burden for one of the three, but in the nature of, the, of these houses and these estates, I think it's a situation where you probably can't divide them uh, among three, uh, in our case, three children, uh, because they simply can't be run by, by committee. Um, but certainly, having gone as far as we've gone uh, in, in, our, in our lifetimes, it would be a matter of great pride to us if one of the children wanted to take it on to another generation. Something well. that we talk about <laughs> quite a lot, actually. But, you know, it's, it's something there's... We, we've got a, a heritage behind us and so much history behind us that we have to take whatever, whatever comes, basically. If we're one of us, or the three of us, end up um, looking after Clonalis, then it's something that we will take a lot of pride in, as Mum and Dad have done. Yeah, I know. I think it's definitely something the three of us would like to continue. I mean, it's too much to give up, to be honest. Um, and again, I mean... I'd like to give, you know, if we had children or whatever, to give them the same amount of enjoyment as we've had out of it. Because for me as a boy, it was a paradise. I once uh, did a paper um, which I entitled Breastfeeding the Dinosaur. Uh, metaphorical description, if you like, of how a house like this effectively is, is a can totally anachronistic in the present day uh, and absorbs one's entire energies. Uh, particularly, I think, of the spouses that have often fallen into these situations. Uh, so it's no doubt it's a lifetime's work and a uh, completely uh, absorbing occupation. As we take our leave of Clonellis, I'm reminded of a poem in the archive room by Kathleen Rain, which sums up the feeling one experiences on a visit to this wonderful house. Clonellis of the muted wood, the incense fragrant cypress, still house where O'Carolan's harp stands silent. Memories here are gathered thick as yellowing leaves of Ireland's sad seasons, generations who kept faith with the high king of an inner kingdom.
Podcast, sponsored by Suzuki.